to come and go. Um, it's the decision has been made by the management to wear a mask, although inside the condo or outside of the building, you don't one that need not wear a mask. So it's uh, it's quite varied uh, in terms of you know policy. I see. Good afternoon, Professor Zulfas. Good evening, Professor Paul Tahalili. Prof. Hendi. Prof. Hendi, good evening. Good evening, Dr. Peter. Uh, how are you doing, Prof. Hendi? Fine, thank you. Good evening, Prof. Paul Tahalili. This is not Paul Tahalili. Jan, Jan Tahalili. Oh, no, I just call Prof. Paul. Oh, if, I just call. <laughs> if, if he's be online now. Good evening to all Good afternoon, uh, Professor George Zulfas. How are you doing? Good afternoon. How are you doing? Yeah, Good I'm fine. Yeah. Good to see you too. Okay, we'll get started very soon. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, everyone. Welcome to the 15th chapter surgical forum of the International College of Surgeons Indonesia section. On behalf of the International College of Surgeons Indonesia section, I would like to express my gratitude to all participants, particularly to our uh, speakers, Professor George Stolfas, also as the world president of the International College of Surgeons, Dr. Magda Hutagalung Halodaya and Dr. Mohamed Zaim Hilmi from Indonesia. Also uh, for Mr. Max Downham, uh, the World Director of the ICS uh, Global from Chicago. And also Professor Paul Tahalili, uh, Professor Hendi Hendarto, Dr. Franciscus Arifin and Dr. Dia Asmarawati. Uh, for this session, the theme is trauma surgery. Professor George Sulfas will be the first speaker, and we can go directly to discussion of uh, his presentation because Professor Sulfas would like to finish his work in the hospital after the discussion. So uh, now we come to the opening speech and I would like to invite Professor Hendi Hendarto, the Vice President of the ICS Indonesian section to deliver the scientific notes. Professor Hendi Hendarto, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Peter. Good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining the International Fetal Surgical Forum, Chapter 15, the International College of Surgeons, Indonesian section. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to Professor Paul Tahalili, Professor George Sulfas, Mr. McDunham, and the speaker, Dr. Magda Hutagalu, Dr. Sam Kilmi, and Dr. Diaz Marawati 
and also Dr. Peter, Dr. Franz, and all webinar participants. From the scientific note, I inform the recommendation from World Society of Emergency Surgery that published in World Journal of Emergency Surgery on March 22, 2021, with the title of the Management of Surgical Patient in the Emergency Setting During COVID-19 Pandemic. The Society recommend, recommend screening for COVID-19 infection at the emergency department or acute surgical patient who are waiting for hospital admission and urgent surgery. The screening workup provide RT-PCR, nasoparin swab test, and baseline chest CT or chest X-ray or a lung ultrasound depending on skill and availability and the management of COVID-19 surgical patient is multidisciplinary. And finally, it is immediate, if an immediate surgical procedure is mandatory, whether laparoscopic or via open approach, the society recommend, recommend doing, doing every effort to protect the operating room staff for the safety of the patient. That's all I think about scientific note. I hope we all stay healthy and stay safe. And finally, thank you for all the speaker for sharing your experience. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Hendy Hendrato, for your uh, scientific notes. And now I would like to invite Professor Paul Tahalili. I will skip, maybe later on will join us. Uh, I would like to invite Professor Georges Sulfas as the president of the International College of Surgeon to deliver the uh, opening speech. Professor Georges Sulfas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Monoko, and uh, I'd like to extend a heartfelt thank you to the Indonesian uh, section for the honor of being invited here. And uh, most of all, I want to congratulate you for uh, what you've created here, which is a tradition and which is an example for sections and surgical associations all around the world. Having this regular quality uh, sessions with important teaching points, with important opportunities to discuss something where young uh, colleagues can uh, learn from the wisdom of more experienced ones and more importantly something a forum where we can all discuss these important topics so i, I really want to congratulate you for setting the standard and the example for what surgical education should be in the difficult times thank you very much professor georges Zulfas. I would like to invite Mr. Max Downham uh, from the headquarter of the International College of Surgeon to deliver the updates of ICS. Mr. Max Downham, the floor is yours. I uh, thank you, Dr. Manopo, uh, Professor Sufas, uh, international governors, and um, uh, you, Dr. Arifin, Dr. Hindarko, uh, Dr. Asmaravati, and Dr. Um, Maliwan, Dr. Uh, Huta Galun, uh, and the other speakers. Uh, it's a privilege uh, and honor for me to be part of this, uh, humble as it is. And I thank you for that, uh, all of you, uh, for this opportunity. Um, the International College of Surgeons uh, uh, has uh, is in official relations with the World Health Organization. And so I thought that I would emphasize in my brief remarks um, this evening, your time, that um, the WHA uh, is on the eve of its uh, 74th World Health Assembly, which is the annual meeting of the WHO. Uh, and um, it is the privilege of the International College of Surgeons to continue to, to its 40 year uh, relationship with the uh, WHO uh, as an uh, uh, unofficial relations as a non-state actor. So 
uh, it's very important. Um, the WHO, I think, serves a very, very valuable purpose. I think uh, were it not, uh, were the WHO not uh, in existence, uh, I have a hunch a group of people would be sitting around a table uh, thinking about how to create something like it. So uh, we're very proud of our status with the uh, WHO. And I did a little bit of preparation. Um, it turns out that at the 22nd uh, ICS World Congress, um, in Mexico City, Mexico, on June 29, 1980, uh, as a guest speaker, the director, the then director general of the uh, WHO, Dr. H. Muller, uh, gave a set of remarks. And um, uh, a couple of those remarks are that surgery is a personal affair. It has to be, uh, has an underlying philosophy and it cannot escape uh, political, social, economic issues. Uh, a little bit of a chuckle because uh, one could say that was written today, but actually Dr. Muller uh, recited that uh, 41 years ago. And so surgery continues uh, as a very, very important aspect. I think uh, as, Dr. as Professor um, Sufas so very eloquently indicated, and I will only just say briefly, uh, the Indonesian section is to be congratulated uh, for all of this, these webinars. I only hope that other sections will emulate uh, what the Indonesian section is doing. Congratulations to you and thank you, Dr. Manopo. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Max Downham. And now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Franciscus Arifin to uh, address the section notes. Dr. Francisco Arifin, the floor is yours. Uh, I'm sharing the screen now, Dr. Uh, Peter. Yeah. Uh, Please okay. put in so, the full, full screen, full screen yes. form. Yeah. Is it okay? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like just to add some uh, uh, facts about our topics today. The today, uh, topics is trauma. And uh, based on the uh, what uh, Max already mentioned that we are in the relations, uh, formal relations with the WHO. So uh, trauma is also one of the um, main program in the WHO. Uh, besides uh, the uh, sur sur surgery or uh, underprivileged people. And uh, uh, so uh, because trauma is a major cause of death in the world. So I'd like to cite the the statement of the WHO on the trauma. Uh, it is uh, consi it considered about 8% of all the death in the world, and it's uh, about 4.4 4, 4 million people each year. For the people age 5 to 29, it is uh, three of the top cause of death, uh, road traffic injuries, homicide, and suicide. But also uh, the, the first one is always uh, the road traffic injuries. And uh, injury and violence are responsible for estimated about 10% of the uh, life uh, expectancy with disability, which also has a massive burden on national economies and uh, costing a lot of uh, money. So preventing of prevention of the uh, injuries and the management, of course, including the surgical management of injuries uh, will facilitate the uh, achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, which is uh, the main program of the WHO for all the countries in the world. So uh, I'd like just to uh, under uh, underline these uh, 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 topics for uh, in, as an introduction for our meeting. Uh, the second part is the update of the, the uh, COVID-19. This is also from the WHO. So uh, as you can see that we are still not reaching a plateau for the COVID-19 world cases. Uh, it's still on the second peak of the uh, uh, number of cases. And you can see that uh, in the purple one is the case in the South and East Asia, which includes India. You can see that it is uh, picking up as well as other countries. 
in the Americas, you see in the orange orange part, it's the second peak. So uh, just a reminder for all of us that we are not, uh, we have not passed the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic and it might get worse. I think that's all for the notes today, Dr. Peter. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you very much, Dr. Francis Arifin. Now we come to the scientific session and the first speaker will be Professor Georges Sulfas. He is a hepatobiliar and GI surgeon and also the president of the International College of Surgeons, the world president. And uh, he will speak on the management of liver trauma. Professor Georges Sulfas, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you see uh, the actual screen, the slide screen? Yes, perfect. Great. So today we're going to talk about the management of liver trauma. And it's a very interesting and it's a very important topic, the management of liver surgery, as a lot of you know and experience daily basis is a challenge. Something which makes it even harder when you actually have, when you also have time not in your favor. So we're gonna talk about trauma in the liver, the different categories of hepatic trauma, and the key thing, which is the principles of liver injury management and what we're doing conservative versus surgical management, and then certain situations which may be a bit more challenging. So trauma in the liver, the hepatic anatomy is an important, a key part of the function as well as the role that the liver plays overall and its involvement in trauma. For example, as you can see here, it, the liver uh, covers a big part of the abdomen the, essentially the whole right upper quadrant and part of the left upper quadrant. And, but on the other hand, the liver is also protected for a big part of it underneath the rib cage. Again, here we see uh, both the significant amount of the area of the abdomen that it covers, but also we see its proximity to different organs and how if there is an injury to the liver, there certainly can be an injury to those organs next to it. The liver has the ligaments that keep it in place, which are mainly on the um, upper and side part. And as far as the liver anatomy, as far as surgical anatomy, things we need to remember is that the liver is divided in half, the right and left lobe, not using the ligament here, but through a line that goes between the IVC and the gallbladder fossa. So this is the line that will divide it into the right side of the liver and the left side of the liver, looking at things from behind. Other things from, again, regarding surgical anatomy that they're important to know, one is a Pringle maneuver and the Pringle maneuver is an effort to control the blood inflow to the liver. Now we have to remember that blood inflow to the liver is mainly through the uh, hepatic artery and the portal vein. And again, three, uh, half of the oxygen comes from the hepatic artery, half from the portal vein, but more importantly, three quarters of the two, three quarters of the blood flow come from the portal vein and only 25% from the hepatic artery in terms of quantity of blood. What that means is that a liver can stay alive with the portal vein and of course, it, it will not stay alive without the portal vein, whereas the liver will not be affected, uh, excuse me, the liver will not stay alive without a portal vein unless it's a chronic situation, and whereas the liver can survive a hepatic artery thrombosis or injury. Now, the Pringle maneuver, which is an effort to control the inflow of blood to the liver and thus decrease any chance of bleeding from an intraparenchymal injury is essentially putting a finger through the foramen of Winslow, coming out behind it, coming out through the gastrohepatic ligament, 
and then being all around these structures and controlling them. Now, the one thing I want to point out and we'll see later is that once you do this, you can control a major, major part of the inflow to the liver, but not everything, because you still have the IVC, the inferior vena cava behind, and the hepatic veins. So that's a key point here, which is really, you know, if anybody's going to remember one thing from this lecture, this would be it. If you're controlling the inflow of blood to the liver, and you don't see the bleeding stop, you see that the bleeding continues and significant bleeding, then you have to worry about whether there is bleeding from the hepatic veins or the IVC behind that you're not able to control. These are the eight segments that we all know. Now, categories of hepatic trauma can be blunt or penetrating. The liver is involved in both categories, again, owing to its size and its location. And you see here that it's involved in a significant percentage of both cases. Now, as far as the grading of the injury, you basically use a scale of one through six, with six being the worst. Essentially, it's complete hepatic revulsion. The two things you measure in each situation is one is the hematoma, what percentage of the surface area it covers, and the other is the last laceration, which is a tear in the capsule, and how far deep that goes. And then you progress downwards till you reach five and six. The cutoff is usually one through three. So one through three are basically safer once you get past that. So some parts of three and only four or five, then you're in the danger zone. Here we can see um, a picture of this with a different grades with part of that's involved with the length of the penetrating injury, the laceration. Here again, you can see the hematoma different sizes occupying different amounts of the liver. And again, you can see that here, you see the smaller amount hematoma. And you see the laceration on the other thing. As we move forward to a higher grade, then you see that it's a deeper laceration and it's a bigger hematoma. So that makes it, that brings it closer. And we're now at stage at grade three to the operative area. And once we reach five, where we have either a big percentage of the hepatic lobe being involved or up three segments, then you know that you're gonna to have to do surgery here to control the bleeding, or at least a very high likelihood that conservative management is gonna fail. Same and even more so for grade four, where you have a subcastle hematoma, which is about 10 centimeters diameter, or the laceration that's about 75% of the hepatic lobe in length. So this is the different grades of injury. And then we move to five where we have a complete evolution. Now, what are some of the principles of management of hepatic trauma. The first thing we need to remember is that the patient is not an isolated liver. The patient is a whole body. So remember the ABC. Don't just go to the liver, even if you see a knife sticking out of the abdomen where the liver should be, even if you see uh, bullet holes there, don't just go there. Remember the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. Make sure you have an airway. If you have an airway, it doesn't matter if you're gonna stop the bleeding. If you don't have an airway, it doesn't matter if you're not going to stop bleeding or not. And you need to improve tissue oxygenation. You want to try and clarify the mechanism of injury. Why? Because it has to do with associated injuries. So if, if it was a gunshot wound, then the bullet can go in many different directions. If it's a knife, then it's more likely to go in a straight direction. And you have to figure out different diagnostic modalities you're going to use what's the level of suspicion, and then timely understand the, when the best period to go to surgery. That's really a key here. 
And part of the reason is because trauma is not just losing blood. It's not just, it has a lot to do with inflammation. That's part of the whole trauma process. We have a triad of death, which can be easily set in motion in the case of hepatic bleeding, where you have these three factors, coagulation problems, acidosis, and hypothermia. And when these three come together, then it's just a vicious circle and just keeps getting worse and worse, and there's not much you can do. You can have compartment syndrome, you can have cerebral edema, a crush injury, you can have ARDS, MOF, sepsis, which are very difficult to deal with under the best of circumstances. And the reason you have this inflammation is because you have a whole several pathways of mediators that get activated and remain active, as you can see here with ARDS, but it's very similar to other, um, with other organs, such as the multi-organ failure system here, which multi-organ failure means two or more systems going down and essentially starts from a 50% mortality. And uh, we see here that it can be any organ involved. And the other thing to keep in mind is infection. There is a common ground between infection, which can become sepsis. So the more uh, brutal part of infection, affecting the blood pressure, having the hypertension, tachycardia, but you can also have syndromes, inflammatory syndromes, which do not include an infection. They do not mean that it's a contaminated area. They just mean that inflammatory mediators have arisen. And that's something to consider in a case like this. Now, the algorithm for the management of patients is, first, you start with an ultrasound, the FAST, which is a focused abdominal uh, sonic test, no, sonogram <coughs> test. Now, the FAST, it should be used ideally like the stethoscope. So the surgeon, every surgeon can be trained on this, grabs it and puts it in the abdomen and kind of like you listen to the abdomen, you do the fast. And if you, it shows no bleeding and you have a hemodynamically stable patient, um, then you can do a CT. The CT will show you whether you have a certain grade of hepatic injury or what is the problem? If it's grade one to three, then you can proceed with conservative management. If it's higher grade, then you have to think of ways to control the bleeding, identify if it's active or inactive, and then decide what the best way to control it could be. And uh, you might need to end up with a laparotomy if other ways such as embolization are not readily available. Now, here's a case that we had with a had a uh, trauma. This was a 14-year-old boy who was riding his bicycle and tried to jump over something with his bicycle. And the steering wheel of the bicycle hit him in the middle of the belly. Uh, since then, he had huge amounts of pain in the middle of the belly. What we saw in the CAT scan was basically uh, significant laceration almost through and through in the center of the liver. And you can see the blood vessels here, but which also involved much more than that, such as the bile ducts. So what we had to do is go there and slowly try to identify what's healthy tissue, what's diseased tissue, and more importantly, where the structures are. And uh, after using different maneuvers to control the bleeding, you give it time and it heals. Now, liver injury can involve the retrohepatic IVC and the hepatic veins, as we mentioned before, which is, can be quite worrisome. The portal vein of hepatic arteries, biliary radicals, parenchyma, and peripheral structures. One thing, um, and there are different ways to control the bleeding. There are many different ways do that, ranging from packing, pressure, uh, putting a, su a suture, finger fracture to dissect, using hemostatic agents, um, apical shunting as an ultimate resort. Now, in blood hepatic injury, when the majority of patients will be stable, 
and so they will have good blood supply and they can be managed non-operatively, which would lead to less transfusions, decreased length of stay, and decreased infectious complications. And the contraindications to that is that the patient needs to be stable hemodynamically, which often can lead to failure in about 15% of the patients. But again, the amount that you actually win out of this is a benefit both for the patient and for the team. A significantly fewer amount of patients with penetrating trauma are eligible for non, uh, non intervention. Now, not too long ago, this was zero. Anytime there was a penetrating injury, uh, everybody would say, just go to, uh, go to surgery. This has changed over time. And it has changed in the sense that we need to see that there is an actual injury with an active bleeding or one of the nearby organs has been affected. So non-operative management does have a role. It's a very important to choose the right patients. So some of that can, you can touch it, so it can be um, who will understand what you're trying to do, the plan. Um, but again, for penetrating, it's a much smaller percentage that will actually get to this point. So there are ways to help you. One is anger embolization, where you basically embolize any bleeding vessels. There are risks, such as creating pseudoaneurysms. Look for active extravasation. Oh, yeah. There are injuries that may be um, unstable, and uh, again, you have to go back to the basics to deal with it, which the basics are achieve hemostasis, do the treatment of that tissue, make sure all the while that you have good exposure, you can actually see yeah, what you're doing, and getting good drainage. Now, when you have significant bleeding, your options are one to pack, another one is a Pringle maneuver. I would like to share some videos. Excuse me. Uh, please unmute all your uh, microphone for all participants except uh, the speaker because it is disturbing. So, okay, George, you can proceed. Okay. Uh, can you see this video? Not yet. Or do you, Not do yet. You, uh, Professor yeah, Sulvas, uh, yeah, you can Dr. proceed. Jur, maybe you uh, you can excuse me, uh, Doctor Hilmi. Stop. Please, please yeah. let me do it. Uh, Professor Sulvas, yeah. Please unmute your uh, microphone. Okay, you oh. can pr proceed right now. Okay. All right, I'm just going to share a video. Yep. This is a video where we try to go through the parenchyma with the use of TUSA. And yeah. Uh, sorry. And the idea here is that you try to divide the hepatic cells and then identify where the vessels are 
and find different ways to ligate them. This is a nice way. It's a very expensive way. You can put sutures, which work very nicely. There are many different ways to identify the blood vessels and uh, the bile ducts. And once you identify them, you can control them. It's a lot of times just using a suture. So that's one. And uh, so the Pringle maneuver is one way to control the bleeding. And again, you control the inflow, the portal vein, the hepatic artery. You do not control the hepatic veins. Very important to remember. And so if there is ongoing bleeding, despite having a Pringle maneuver, you need to think about the retrohepatic IVC and the major hepatic veins. And if the, that's the case, then you need to consider vascular exclusion techniques, which means bypassing parts of the IVC or close hepatic veins, which have been injured. One way to do that is putting a Foley balloon, a Foley catheter, inflating the balloon. And this way it closes the openings. Another one is trying to create a bypass between the IVC and the atrium. These are all very ambitious endeavors, not very easily easy to do, and not certainly not easy to do when you're under pressure. Another way is to go to veno veno bypass if you have that readily available. Um, again, not always as easy. I'll, I'll tell you, for example, our hospital, which is an academic center, which we do a lot of liver transplants, we do not have veno veno bypass for some reason. Well, the main reason we don't have cardiac surgery. So that's the problem. Um, now, packing. It sounds simple, and very important. It's another lesson that everybody should remember is that when you have the liver bleeding, the best way to control the bleeding is your hand. Put pressure. That's the first most important way. Why? Because it will control things. And two, it will give time to anesthesia to come up with the necessary blood products, uh, red blood cells, FFP needed to get the patient in a better condition. So that's key. Don't mm -hmm. underestimate packing. And there are some times where you have significant bleeding where the only thing you can do is pack. So you put compresses, packs around the liver, creating pressure and stopping the bleeding. And then you take the patient to the ICU. Why? Because you want to give time now that you've stopped the bleeding for them to control the liver function and improve that. And you leave that usually for about two to three days, the risk for living more is infection. Again, this is a, a great quote, quote by Dr. Wall which says much has been written on the topic of hepatic venous injuries, and there are possibly more authors on the subject than survivors of the procedures described. And that's true. People, this is a very difficult procedure and a very difficult time to do it. So usually you don't end up with survivors. Now, when you have the venous injuries, you have to remember the retrohepatic IVC. These are the hepatic veins to the right, the middle, and the left. And the retrohepatic IVC is seven centimeters in length. And there are the veins there. And you have the major hepatic veins, which essentially go into it. Now, this is the dangerous part of trauma. One, because it goes unrecognized. We're trying to control bleeding in the front and this goes in the back. It's also venous bleeding. You're not gonna have spasm. It's not gonna stop. It's not easily compressible. 
and it's not easy to get to. You do have to mobilize the liver. So it can be very deadly. Now, elements can be either direct injury to the vein or to the surrounding tissues. And again, there will be free bleeding depending on the extent and the severity of the injury. If you can directly repair it, you can see the hole and you can repair it's worth doing. But generally remember, don't lose too much time, put pressure, stop the bleeding, get the patient to the ICU to help them survive and come and fight another day. There's a lot of questions about direct repair and many differences in the mind. Um, IVC injuries have been repaired. Thomas Sargo transplant center was one of the first ones. And there are different ways. One is the atrial cable shunt, which you do it, a shunt between the atrium and the cable to bypass the area of the injury. Resection is generally something you do not do in trauma, liver trauma. You do not resect the liver. This is wrong in many different levels. And certainly, very rarely, if not at all, do you transplant. Uh, so you try to contain the bleeding with deep parenchymal sutures and see what the difference is in terms of the bleeding. Um, but there are some other ways, such as using balloon tamponade, as you can see here. Again, finding ways to apply pressure in areas of the bleeding that may be bleeding. That's the whole idea. So in terms of the principles used, wide hepatic mobilization and direct venous ligation uh, should be a ban on the case of venous uh, injury. Momentum and gauze packing provide alternatives with much lower mortality. And recurrence of bleeding on some most are not major sources of mortality. Now, wide hepatic mobilization, direct venous ligation should be abandoned for venous injuries. And packing with a mentum or gauze are actually, it's actually a better alternative, at least for the initial time point, having lower mortality. Uh, and based on the type of injury that you had, restoring the different containment structures around the described veins may be a better injury. So what is new, can, there are many different types of hemostatic agents out there in the market that one can use. There are many different types of packing material. The one thing to remember is the basics work. You don't need expensive things. You don't even need the glue. You just need the basic things and patience. These are the two important things. Uh, now, uh, there are some new approaches controlling the bleeding, such as with the use of endovascular surgery and different ways Here the needles. Injury to the portal triad can be very significant and very concerning. You usually see it with penetrating injuries in a situation where you may have to ligate the portal vein. If you do, you do need a second look laparotomy because it certainly can place uh, the bell uh, and enter. And same thing for the proper hepatic artery where um, you can, which you can ligate. Um, it may be a problem for patients who are in extremis, so hypertensive patients, and it can also be a problem for the bile ducts. Now, I'm not sure how much time we have. I have a few questions with multiple choice answers. We can go through, it's like three of them. Uh, Peter, I'll, I'll follow your advice on this. Okay. Uh, I will open the discussion directly after your session because you will leave earlier. So, uh, is there any question from 
uh, the other speaker uh, to Professor George Sulfas. Maybe uh, Dr. Magda Hutagalung, have you question to Professor Sulfas? I don't have any. Okay, uh, Dr. Dr. Hilmi, do you have any question uh, to no, no. Professor Sulfas? No. Uh, okay, from, from the floor. Is there any question from the floor? I have a question uh, for you, Professor Sulfas. Mm -hmm. Is it a usual procedure uh, in the liver trauma if you do the endoscopic procedure to elaborate uh, the liver trauma or you just go directly to the open surgery? Yeah, um, I, I go directly to open surgery. Um, and I think for the most part, that's what most people um, do at this point. And the reason is you um, a matter of speed, a matter of um, convenience, and a matter of having a wide field to make sure you see everything and you have enough space to work. You also want to check for other injuries. Um, I, I do suspect that as surgeons become more and more um, um, able with the laparoscopic procedures. We have generations coming who have never seen an open cholestectomy. Um, so this could change. So I don't, I don't want to uh, read the future. I don't want to guess what's going to happen. I think if you can do it as well with the endoscopically, you should. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Sulfas. Any question from the floor? Dr. Franz Arifin, uh, do you have a question to Professor Sulfas? Uh, yes, uh, I, yeah, I'm sure. interested a lot in the, the surgery, uh, the, the presentation of Professor Sulfas. Uh, one question is that uh, we have a controversy whether do we, ha do we have to free the liver from the ligament when we want mm -hmm. to pack the liver. Because even packing the liver is uh, 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 recommended in uh, different ways. I mean, some says that the liver should be wrapped around with a, a white uh, gauze. And some says that you just put the packing on below the diaphragm and below the liver. So it compressed from uh, uh, superior to inferior. But in order to wrap around the liver, liver you have to free the uh, coronal ligament and the, uh, the, the uh, 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 sorry, the coronal ligament. So it means that the liver is very uh, free inside of the, the abdomen. So what is your, in your opinion, is the best way to pack the, the liver? I professor? think um, what ends up happening a lot of times is you you may already have freed a big part of the ligaments in your mobilization. And uh, as you very correctly pointed out, there are different ways to do the packing. One is putting a gauze all around the liver. The other one is putting compresses tightly around it. And uh, this is one of the cases uh, where if you put it too loosely, the compresses or the gauze, it will continue to bleed. If you put them too tightly, it can actually lead to liver necrosis. Mm. And um, unfortunately, I have to say that I've seen that happen in a patient okay. needing a transplant, actually, because the liver necrosis from the compress is pressed around it. So how much? Just right. But it's, 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 it's one of those things where, um, you know, too much effort can lead into problems. Okay. And you, you leave it for about three to four days, mm. checking the patient, but you need to live it a significant time, hopefully without having problems with infections. Yeah. So, uh, one other thing is that uh, we are recommend, recommended to, to evaluate whether our packing is effective before we close the abdomen. means we have to be certain that our packing stops the bleeding. But in order to do that, most of the time you still has to release the packing. So uh, how do you do the evaluation 
of the effectiveness of packing before you close the abdomen without remove, removing the packing? Well, you, you, I, I do the evaluation while closing the abdomen. Basically, we pack it, we wait for it, wait to make sure it's not bleeding, and then we start closing. And the, the question when you're closing is to make sure you don't end up with a compartment syndrome. You don't end up with a situation because of all the bleeding, not just with the liver, the whole trauma, blood products, and other products patient may have gotten, you are very much in danger of a compartment syndrome. So mm -hmm. a lot of times, if you're going to be packing the liver, one thing you might want to consider just closing loosely. So either closing the skin or putting in an absorbable mesh and closing, knowing that you're going to be back in about three to four days. So mm -hmm. you're going to reopen things. So in the liver packing, we are recommended to do a temporary closure rather than right. to do right. a formal abdominal closure. I think that's, that's wise. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Thank, Thank you, Professor Sulfas. Any other question from the floor? Okay, I think uh, this is uh, enough for your session and your discussion, Professor Sulfas. If you need to leave, I think you can uh, proceed with your job in the hospital. Thank you very okay. much for your participation and your dedication. Thank you. I appreciate your understanding. And again, thank you for this invitation. It's a great honor to be here. Yeah. Come on, yeah. Thank, thank you. you very much, Professor Sulfas. Thank for you, the next, Professor Sulfas. Yeah. Yeah. For the next, I would like to invite Dr. Magda Gutagalung Hulidaya. She is a plastic reconstructive and aesthetic surgeon. And he will address she will address her presentation on the cranio the challenges on craniofacial surgery. Dr. Magda Hutagalung, the floor is yours. Okay. okay, thank you for your introduction. Good afternoon, my honorable colleagues. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, clearly, perfect. Clearly, okay. Good afternoon, my honorable colleagues of the International College of Surgeons, in particular, my seniors and colleagues of the Indonesian section. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee by, led by Dr. Peter Manopo for your kind invitation. I'll be sharing some of the general challenges in craniofacial surgery beyond trauma that I face with my team in our institution. These are the institutions where I've worked for 13 years, Dr. Sutomo General Hospital and Universitas Airlanga, Medical Faculty Surabaya East Java were established in 1948. The hospital has around 1,490 beds and has been a referral center for the Eastern region of Indonesia. As an introduction to my topic, we know that the principles of craniofacial surgery are now well established to treat severe facial deformities. Paul Tessier in 1967 developed these techniques. He emphasized team approach to these problems by combining with his neurosurgical and multidisciplinary colleagues. I will be presenting surgical challenges and progress in areas of craniofacial trauma, clefts, tumors, and craniosynostosis. <laughs> One of the primary challenges is establishing and maintaining a multidisciplinary team. Because this kind of surgery is associated with a high risk of morbidity and mortality, a multidisciplinary approach enables complete assessment, minimalization of risk, and adequate measurement of results. This is the craniofacial team at the Dr. Sutomo Hospital, Universitas Airlanga, represented by uh, the most senior staffs. There's the plastic surgeon, the neurosurgeon, pediatrician, anesthetist, ophthalmologist, ENT surgeon, the neurologist specializing in sleep apnea, orthodontist, rehab and speech specialist, pediatric orthopedic surgeon, and a med the medical engineer led um, by those from the Department of Industrial Design, Institute Technology, Spulu, November. Our department for many years has the privilege of working directly uh, with Professor David John David from the Australian Craniofacial Unit, 
Professor Arvin Mathaisen from Erasmus Medical Center of the Netherlands, and Prof. Lun Jo Lo from Changkung Memorial Hospital, Taiwan. This shows a multidisciplinary meeting for a craniosynostosis case. We see all the team members and the patient with his family. Uh, these are multidisciplinary meetings for discussing orthomathic cases. Um, we can see here that we try to relax by discussing cases even with lunch. Another challenge is educating people, especially healthcare providers in primary secondary centers in the initial treatment or timely referral of patients. For sure, we know that correct surgical timing for craniomaxillofacial fractures will improve surgical outcome. And that is within two, the first two weeks post-injury. And even um, earlier for blowout fractures, and this is to avoid fibrosis of the periorbital uh, tissues and the extraocular muscles, which may uh, lead to established diplopia. And then trauma and growth period receiving delayed treatment would, will increase disturbed growth process. I will show some late referrals re requiring more surgical effort. Yeah. This is a 34 year old woman presented with double vision since 10 months ago when her left blowout fracture was untreated after a motor vehicle accident. She a sustained diplopia and restricted ocular motility in all directions with dilated left pupil and eyelidosis and flat left molar. And she was diagnosed with left blowout fracture, third cranial nerve paresis and zygoma fracture. So we had to do the arduous procedure of osteotomizing all four borders of the left zygoma quadripod and do four point plate fixation and apply or fix titanium mesh to her orbital floor. These shows her pre-op x-ray showing the depressed malar and the blowout fracture and the post-op uh, CT scan showing the restored or corrected uh, zygoma and the blowout fracture. 13 months post-op, the diplopia persisted but with uh, less severity and it was reduced with straightforward gaze. However, this had to be done with compensatory wide opening of her left upper eyelid. So our uh, Ophthalmologist colleague did a strabismus correction, and four months post-op, there was very minimal diplopia in upward and lateral gaze, but with symmetrical upper eyelids. And fortunately, two years after fir the first surgery, uh, she, uh, she already recovered her former life. She became, I mean, even became a master chef in a six-star hotel. Another case is an eight-year-old boy who presented late with trismus. Sorry. With Trisma since around four years, history of fall from cradle. He had a history of a fall from his cradle at one year of age, and he had undeveloped lower jaw, occlusal cant, and midline deviation. His maximum interincisal opening was only one centimeter. So he was diagnosed with severe left temporomandibular joint ankylosis. These are his pre-op CT scan showing a bony block of his TMJ on the left side. So we had to do an osteotomy of his con TMJ joint, yeah, temporomandibular joint, and then also a left coronoidectomy and then an arthroplasty with left temporal muscle flap. Yeah. One month with up, he has already shown a significant improvement with a maximum interincisal opening of three centimeters. And normally, as a note, um, hinge motion by digastric and hyoid muscle accounts for the initial two centimeters, at, after which lateral pterygoid muscle, which could have been injured in this case, takes the role of opening the jaw. Uh, he is uh, continually being seen by the rehabilitation specialist for intensive physiotherapy and he's planned for orthodontics and orthognathic surgery at maturity. Another challenge is developing the ability to detect genetic mutations um, among the syndromes. This is being advanced by the genetic lab in the Institute of Tropical Disease. We have treated around 35 cases of syn syndromic craniosynostosis up to the year 2021. So this facility will help us confirm the diagnosis and to elucidate, educate families so we can help prevent a case like this where four of its 
family members um, have the cruising syndrome. Another challenge is achieving acceptable surgical outcome with limited resources for surgical planning and preparation. The following are standard examinations we do. Most are covered by the insurance, except the ones printed in bold, and the underline are not yet available in our place. Infra-op navigation would have been useful in the uh, management of neglected blowout fracture, like the ones I showed, which is radiation-free and ideal for infra-op guidance to the virtually planned reconstruction, allowing verification for or of proper reconstruction as a with intraop navigation, we can uh, detect intraoperatively discrepancy in implant position and also intraoperatively uh, immediately correct the, the um, improper implant position, incorrect implant position. Another illustration is to compare the conventional way versus the more advanced method to treat tissue deficiency. So this is a case of a 45 year old woman with, who, who, who presented with double vision and flat right cheek since eight months after a motor vehicle accident. And she, there were established problems, including a right enothalmus, diplopia, right flat malar due to right zygoma fracture. And the lower pictures show her at three months post osteotomy and bone grafting. Um, she already uh, um, achieved facial symmetry and restored and diplopia and her diplopia was corrected. And uh, the more advanced, the more advanced uh, method to correct tissue deficiency is by doing 3D printing. And this minimizes operative time and blood loss and maximizes surgical outcome. This allows um, the fabrication of custom made implants. For example, a 16 year old female um, we, with right tessier clef number three, she had prior soft tissue reconstruction and bone graft to her right maxilla, which was apparently resorbed. So she still showed facial asymmetry, depressed right cheek and orbital dystopia resulting in diplopia. So soft tissue and bone analysis were made. Using computer-assisted design, her normal side image on her CT scan was uh, mirrored to overlap the defect and draft the implant design. So it was discovered that her right inferior orbital rim and floor were 3.86 to 4.77 millimeters lower, and her right zygoma and maxilla were 1.24 to 8.07 millimeters more depressed. And this is her the final design and the implant model on the skull model. Implant fabrication used silicone-based template and polymethyl methacrylate containing gentamicin with the advantages of no resorption, no donor site morbidity, accurate anatomy, good aesthetics. And with this substance, this, it avoids exothermic reaction and risk of infection. According to a study done by Rafaela de Souza, in 2017, it was found that complication rates of PMMA were comparable to those of autologous bone grass or titanium. The, the, the pictures on the, in, at the top are intraoperative pictures, and this is her at one month post-op. As her edema uh, subside, subsided, there was more symmetry and the diplopia was already corrected. Three D printing also allows pre and intra op guide. This is a case uh, I did with my colleague in, in Relax Miputri. She was diagnosed um, with Tessier Clef one thirteen post encephalocele excision. She sustained hypertellurism, which was very severe in an open bite, and so we did a facial bipartition. The picture on the top left is her. Uh, preoperatively and we designed, we used 3D models, yeah, and we designed the osteotomy lines. 
so as not to injure the cribriform plate. Yeah, we try to preserve the cribriform plate. And in fact, in this case, we were able to reduce her medial intercontinental distance by two centimeters. And this is her at one week post-op already mobilizing, walking around the ward. This allows two mock surgery, 3D printing also allows mock surgery model, which is what we did um, before the surgery. Okay. This is another case in which we had to do multiple mock surgeries with 3D models because we do not have we do not yet have the software th to do uh, 3D virtual planning. So this is a case of uh, involving 20 year old woman, but she complained of progressive facial asymmetry since eight years. Uh, she complained of abnormal bite and pain in both jaw joints. There was midline shift to the right, um, in, including the chin, mandible, lip, and nose, and elongation of the left ramus of the mandible. Uh, there was a cross bite and, a, and an occlusal canting, um, and, but the maximum interincisal opening was normal. And this shows uh, her enlarged and elongated left hemimandible. And the CT scans show de deviation to the right side of both jaws and anterior angulation and less dense left condyle and compensatory lengthening of the left maxilla. So we planned for her to have a bimaxillary surgery and a left coronoidectomy, and if necessary, a left condylectomy, and, and then do a biopsy. Um, the orthodontic pre-surgical planning was to have the left maxilla impacted seven millimeters, the right maxilla uh, elongated downward to seven millimeters, and a yaw rotation to the left around 13 degrees. But there, there arise a question, um, um, which, procedure from the, these two should we do? Should we do a bilateral sagittal split osteotomy or a vertical subsigmoid ramus osteotomy? So because of the lack of 3D virtual planning, we had to do multiple mock surgeries. We, and um, this is um, the considerations of bilateral sagittal split osteotomy. Um, we see that after doing this mock surgery, we find that there would be there will be disadvantages such as alveolar nerve exposure, nerve injury with the excision of excess bone, and not enough surface contact between the split bone segments. And then with bilateral vertical subsigmoid ramus osteotomy with um, left condylectomy, without left condylectomy, the advantages uh, this off offers yeah, is no alveolar nerve exposure and adequate surface contact between the vertically cut bone segments. And this shows it with left condylectomy. So having performed that, then we decided to do a Lefort 1 osteotomy, a bilateral vertical ramus subsigmoid osteotomy, left coronoidectomy, and if necessary, a left condylectomy. The Department of Industrial Design of ITSN did help us uh, in marking the uh, certain landmarks, such as the lingula of the mandible, so that we uh, would be able to avoid that during the surgery. But that's as far as it, it, go, it went here. Yeah. So this is her um, five months post-op with facial symmetry and better occlusion. And she had she continued her orthodontic treatment until one year. This is what I mean by 3D virtual planning and profile prediction. Um, so this is still unavailable in our place. Another challenge is educating doctors in treatment protocol. Um, misguiding, given misguided guiding advice, then there would be permanent morbidities and death. This is um, the treatment protocol for cleft lip and palate. We apply universally accepted protocols. And as we see here, um, we do orthodontic treatment at seven years and alveolar bone graft at nine years of age. I will show some cleft cripples due to 
negligence of the protocol. So this is a case, uh, a male case, five year old, uh, who presented to us um, with an underbite and concave facial profile, difficult mastication, regurgitation, hypernasal speech, and he wanted a quick fix. And um, his intraoral examination showed a th type three malocclusion. He wasn't told after his uh, cleft lip and palate repairs that he was to have an, um, an alveolar bone graft orthodontic treatment. So um, this shows his persistent alveolar clefts. And our orthodontic surgical planning was to do a surgery first by maxillary surgery um, with nine millimeter maxillary advancement and four millimeter mandibular setback. These are intra-op. Um, photos yeah, in which we use two wafers to guide us during the surgery. It shows his pre-op compared to his post-op occlusion and his post-op orthodontic treatment lasted one year. We still had to do remaining procedures to uh, make more perfect his surgical outcome. Um, he, he went th through a nasoendoscopy by our ENT surgeon um, his, we repaired his anterior fistula and we did a pharyngeal flap to improve his uh, quality of speech. This is in pre-op and two months post-op showing improved uh, facial profile. This is his um, x-ray, post, immediate post-op. This is him at three years post-op with dental mock-up. Another uh, cleft cripple is a, a lady we operated on 20 years old. She presented with underbite, concave facial profile, difficult mastication, hypernasal speech, and she also wanted a quick fix. Uh, this shows her very concave facial profile and her uh, severe underbite and crowding, crowding of her teeth. Uh, her, her radiologic exam shows now the persistent alveolar cleft, teeth crowding and caries. So what we did was a surgery first procedure with one centimeter maxillary advancement, clockwise rotation to lower the mandible, one centimeter and bone grass. You have three minutes left. Okay. So um, fortunately we had the experience, we had the experience to perform Lefort one without previous alveolar bone graft. And we have a very good orthodontist. That's the, the purpose of having a, a very good multidisciplinary team. So this is him. At, this is her at two months post-op, and this is her two uh, post-op cephalometry. This is a protocol for syn uh, syndromic craniosynostosis uh, from the Erasmus Medical Center and the Australian Craniofacial Unit, both agreeing that the primary cranial expansion should be done around six months of age. Given the wrong directions, um, then. Uh, Patients would remain permanently blind and um, other morbidities, yeah. Uh, we have to uh, understand this uh, graph. The neural tissues complete 90% of growth at six years of age, and the growth of eyeball follows brain growth as, is, as the extension of brain. So uh, this is a case that, um, a very neglected case, a 10-year-old boy with severe Crusoe syndrome and he suffered from apneic episodes during sleep and severe mixed sleep apnea and severe exorbitism and signs of increased ICP, severe class three malocclusion, severe hearing loss, but, but an IQ score of 90. <clears throat> this shows a CT scan with Arnold Cherry malformation type one. The CT scan showing pansutural synostosis. We did the pre-op planning with 3D model. This is the intra-op monoblock advancement that we perform on him. And um, this is him um, um, in the upper ICU with ventilator support until the third day post-op. And then a tracheostomy was done on post-op day three. Um, we, we applied monoblock distraction with um, advancement of one millimeter per day and a total advancement of two centimeters and consolidation period of three months. And after um, two centimeter advancement, the, there was improvement the severe OSA became mild and there was no more central and mixed apnea. It was discharged one month post-op. This is after three months solidification. We removed the uh, rigid um, device, yeah, 
and um, a bit of fixation at the zygoma. This is his post-op CT scan showing uh, adequate um, advancement. Six months post-op, he was still tracheostomy dependent. Our ENT surgeon did a turbinoplasty, adenotonsillectomy, and septoplasty. And this is him after uh, 16 months uh, with increased airway volume and the tracheostomy was removed. This is him at six months post-op with everything else improved. This is him one year post monoblock. Um, he's uh, very active here. Yeah. And fortunately, even though he remained permanently blind, he regained a much better quality of life. He, he, here we see him um, uh, learning the, how to read the Braille. As we see from this table, it is worth all the efforts to manage patients with cranius and associate syndrome, especially Trunzone syndrome, um, where 80% of them have an IQ of more than 85. I only have a very few more slides. Uh, the last, the last um, issue is achieving surgical correction with limited resources for treatment. As in this case, a five-year-old um, boy with Pfeiffer, um, he suffered severe exorbitism, luxating eyes and exposure keratitis, and a very poor vision of one over 300. And he had to breathe through the mouth. And if shut, it would cause him apnea. There were signs of increased ICP and central sleep apnea. And he had laryngeal malacia type two and severe class three malocclusion. This is his pre-op CT. Uh, we did a, um, actually in this patient, we, we needed to have an internal distractor uh, applied on him for uh, gradual advancement. But um, unfortunately we do, we, do, we, do, we do not have that device. And so we did a direct frontal fascia elevation up to 1.5 centimeters. That's um, his post-op CT scan. And that's him one month post-op with improved vision. Um, and there was no more snoring and he breathes freely via his nose. That's here one year, four months post-op. And that's him with another patient who also had uh, the same syndrome. Yeah, But um, fortunately he, he, he didn't need an internal distractor but only an external distractor, which we already have. Um, we can see that they, the, the boy on the, le, the right side yeah, had a better surgical outcome than the left, the one on the left. As a conclusion, craniofacial surgery has its challenges, but by keeping the goodwill of, of caring for our patients, by continuing to attain to the highest standards and working together with our multidisciplinary team, then major obstacles can be overcome. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mahda Hutagalung for your very informative presentation. Uh, we will have the discussion after all the sessions. And now I would like to invite Dr. Hilmi. He is an orthopedic surgeon to address his presentation on pelvic trauma. Dr. Hilmi, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Peter Manopo. Uh, <clears throat> Good evening to all participants of this webinar and thank can, can, can yeah please put in the full screen form I, I no no I I, I stop first. Uh, I have a, uh, okay. Can you uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, clearly. Oh, but my voice is clear. Good. Okay. Uh, good evening to all participants of this webinar, and thank you to the HS Innocent Section for giving me the opportunity to speak at this wonderful event. In this event, I will present the topic of pelvic ring injury 
decision making and management in acute phase. <clears throat> pelvic ring can withstand the body weights because pelvic ring constructed by two inuminate in, bone and one sacrum connected by ligamentous complex whereas uh, anteriorly yeah anteriorly connected by symphysis and posterior connected by strong ligament there is a uh, where is sacroiliac ligament if we see the pelvic ring in horizontal plane that the posterior structure of the pelvic yeah as assume as the suspension bridge for is uh, spina ili spina iliacis sorry spina iliaca post uh, Infer posterior inferior siap is a function as a pillar and sacrum function as bridge and the posterior sacro sacroiliac ligament as a cable wire. So if the cable wire or pillar break the structure will be collapsed yeah uh, this paper show early death in patient with pelvic fracture is commonly because of hemorrhage or associated brain injury while for survivor frequently expand the long-term medical and social health problem. Why it has happened? The volume of the pelvic was assumed to be cylinder, where the formula for the form depend on the radius, yeah, depend on radius and height. Therefore, if there is change in the radius, or height due to pelvic instability. And if there is a bleeding, it will accommodate a lot of bleed, a lot of blood accumulate, accumulated in the into pelvis. Yeah. Bleeding not only collect into pelvic space, but also in the intra going to interabdominal or intraperitoneum bleeding or as an external bleeding. So, if we have a patient and then we doing clinic examination because of high energy trauma cases, including examination patient presentation with shock or not. There is a lesson around the uh, inguinal area or lesion around the trochanter area or we have a problem in the bladder and perineal wound. Maybe this person suspected suspect of trauma pelvis. Then carry out the uh, radial experiment is performed to determine the, the type of fracture because the fracture pattern were described on the basis of anatomical fracture pattern on radiograph to determine fracture stability. There is a unstable fracture or unstable fracture. Based on clinical and hemodynamic stability on the trauma pelvic can be defined as stable pelvic and stable hemodynamic, stable pelvic and unstable hemodynamic, unstable pelvic and un unstab uh, and stable he hemodynamic, unstable pelvic and unstable hemodynamic. In the pelvic trauma management, 
which is the <coughs> is a high trauma cases must be done by a team. Where is each team member has their respective role? Look, uh, yeah, look, uh, F1 team, yeah, and in a team, there must be a leader with the, with the existence of team leader, teamwork is more coordinated. And who is the team leader must be negotiated, depend on which uh, problem, a uh, major problem, which is the major problem. There is maybe as a team leader. In the pelvic trauma management, itself focus on control hemorrhage if the patient come instead of shock and then stabilize pelvic injury the brideman wound to change yeah a dirty or contaminated wound into a clean wound to reduce the risk of infection sometime different thing close to me if there is a rectal or penal wound is present. This paper show that with a systematic multidisciplinary approach on the on pelvic injury, with directed initially only at the hemorrhage control, can lead to significant improvement in survival. Hemorrhage control in pelvic trauma consists pelvic confit uh, pelvic containment intervention angiography and pelvic packing for pelvic containment it mean bone stabilization can use pelvic binder or circumference sheeting external fixation or pelvic cycling Pelvic binder or circumference sitting is very easy application and can be done by a doctor who in charge in emergency room, including general practitioner who have received ATLS training. This is a example of simple and fabricated pelvic binder. This picture show the circumferential sitting. This, yeah. This picture show uh, the circumferential sitting and the step by step in which it's applied. There is a simple way. Now, how the role of external fixation in the pelvic injury? External. External fixation can be done immediate application to the patient in extremist condition to control hemorrhage, which is can control the pelvic volume, not expansion, thus tamponade occur. So can stabilize clot prior treatment movement and should be placed before emergency laparotomy. This picture shows that early reduction and skeletal stability creating an environment there where is a tamponade can occur. You can see this picture. Several way of placing a set screw in external fixation application. You can do as a high root, yeah, or we can do. Uh, this is high, high root. This is a uh, low root. Low root is in the supra astabular uh, region, and this is uh, for the CS and supra astabular region. But. In vertical unstable pelvic fracture, 
and external fixation external fixation uh, ex, our external fixator does not control motion in the posterior sacroiliac complex so pelvic C clamp can help control the postural pelvic but need attention the permanent step can be uh, accomplished in the 24 until 72 hour after inserting because C clamp is a temporary tool not a permanent tool the application of C clamp is uh, easy quick simple and reusable this is a example of cclam application and the type or shape of the cclam now how about the uh, intervention angiography intervention angiography is not optimal for situation but useful as adjunct to other method but this procedure a good method if resources are available now how about the role of pelvic packing in the pelvic fracture the role of pelvic packing in the pelvic injury if bleeding from the pelvic cannot be stopped even the bone has been stabilized by making a long midline incision and go between peritoneum and pelvis this procedure need repeated procedure because this procedure is only a damage control surgery and the second look surgery is needed if the patient facial facial is stable with uh, 15 until 30 three percent risk of pelvic infection and sometimes intervention angiography is needed post packing is c claim is really necessary the pros agree that c claim is the most effective procedure to stop the ongoing blood loss and in hemodynamically unstable patient but the con agree that the c clamp has post serious complication and c clamp should be used only in certain condition which is pelvic binder is quick safe effective to reduce blood loss This paper show that non-invasive non technique, uh, circumferential or pelvic bender, is the fastest way to provide immediate stabilization for hemodynamic instability, secondary to pelvic ring disruption. The use of pelvic binder was associated with significant reducing in transfusion requirement and length of stay compared with uh, external fixation another paper show that the application of non invasive procedure is recommended as a early strategy from bio, bio from biomechanical biomechanical studies on carpal show an effective pelvic volume reduction with and improve hemorrhage control but the use of pelvic binder alone does not seem to reduce mortality uh, another paper show that application of c clamp is called the contraindication for comminuted and transforaminal sacral fracture fracture of the iliac wing and lateral compression type injury for this reason Ciclam is not widely used in many trauma center. This is my example. The first case, 
a woman came with a shock step and placed around the inguinal area yeah and fi- fa- vagina and perineum and also open fracture of the tibia from uh, radio- radiologic examination result unstable fact unstable fact uh, unstable pelvis and had been done the bridegroom she came she claim application and external fixation of the pelvic and then colostomy and external fixation on the tibia after three days she claim was removed yeah? and the patient can walk Another example, woman came with a, with a shock stick, ruptured vagina with unstable pelvic, had been done C-claim application, the bridegroom and exploration of vagina, but during the operation, patient fall in the shock and hypothermia. We were decided to stop operation and send patient to the ICU to improve his uh, physio- physiological status. And after three days, we did second look operation with application, external fixation, and percut- percutaneous screw fixation. Therefore, the patient can be well nursing care. Yeah, We can turn lock roll to nurse nursing in the Butok area. Another case, woman with uh, came with shock states and abdominal extended. You, you can see this uh, abdominal extended. From radiologic examination result was unstable pelvic, and from CT abdomen, yeah. We found external bleeding, internal bleeding, and had been done sorry and had been done uh cclaim application and laparotomy exploration but during the during the operation patient shock again then the operation was stopped while uh, maintaining nc claim and left the intra organ abdominal uh, abdominal organ left in the outside but the general surgeon close with the plastic then the patient was brought to ICU to improve his physio- physiological status after three days was done second operation just focus on intraabdominal organ management and keep the sick claim and and then patient sent to the ICU again Uh, from this paper showed that joint decision making between trauma surgeon and orthopedic traumatologist has resulted in improved patient survival in management of unstable pelvic fracture. Listen to learn or conclusion in trauma pelvic control hemorrhage is important step as a as a life saving surgery. Pelvic bone stability improve pelvic containment and facilitate pulmonary toilet and appropriate nursing care. Not every unstable pelvis with unstable hemodynamic patient has to be put in C-claim since the use of pelvic binder is safer and as effective as C-claim. Multidisciplinary approach has resulted in improved patient survival. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hilmi, for your informative presentation. Uh, before we go to the discussion session, I would like to invite Dr. Dias Marawati to address the summary notes. Dr. Dias Marawati, the floor is yours. Thank you. Dear guest, 
Thank you for attending the International College of Surgeon, Indonesia Section Surgical Forum, Chapter 15, Trauma Surgery. As we know that trauma is a major cause of death. Our topics are interesting with a few thoughts on what we have learned this forum and how that fits into the overall events. Knowledge sharing is an important part of what we do. I would like to say thank you to Professor George Solvas, MD, PhD, FICS, with the topic Management of Liver Trauma. The important points are categorization of hepatic trauma, principle of liver injury management, conservative management, how and why, surgical management, how and why, AAST organ injury scale, grade one until five, blunt and penetrating trauma and trauma complications. I also would like to say thank you to Dr. Mahda Hutagalung, FICS, with the topic challenges in craniofacial surgery. The important points are essential factors for successful management, correct surgical timing for CMF fractures to improve the surgical outcome, the example several interesting cases, implant fabrication, mock surgery with model, orthodontic pre-surgical planning, protocol for cleft lip and pellet, and schemon's growth curve. I would like to say thank you to Dr. Muhammad Zaim FICS with the topic management of pelvic fracture. The important points are biomechanics of the pelvic ring, perfect volume change and blood loss, clinical and radiological assessment, defining pelvic stability, trauma team organization, pelvic fracture management, WSES, World Journal of Emergency Surgery Classification and Guidelines, and the example several interesting cases. And finally, congrats and thanks to the steering committee and organizing committee for all of this hard work to make this happen, well done all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dia Asmarawati for your summary notes. And now we come to the discussion session. The first part of the discussion uh, will be the inter-speaker discussion. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Mahda for the first time to ask question to Dr. Kilmi. <laughs> Time is yours. I don't, I don't have any question. Yet. Okay, thank you. Dr. Kilmi, have you any question uh, to Dr. Mahda? No, I don't have a question for Dr. Magda. Okay, I have a question uh, to Dr. Magda. Yes, no. yeah, it is an ethical question. Uh, for performing this surgery, uh, basically about uh, the cases that you have uh, presented, to what extent you can explain to the patient or to the family uh, for the informed consent because the result will be complicated. You have to wait, maybe not uh, for a short time, but maybe for a long time after the surgery. So how can you explain and how to give the guarantee to the patient or the family of the patient about the result? Even you have to wait for a long time for the post-op care. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Peter, um, for the question. I, I do it the standard way, and nothing, nothing to hide. Yeah. Um, and because most of the, I think most of the cases I showed were complicated cases that which who, who required secondary surgeries. So I, I uh, openly would say that um, the results will not be perfect. Yeah and that maybe multiple surgeries will be required. And um, I, I, would, I, I wouldn't bring, I would be very careful about what the, um, the negligence, the previous negligence um, did, did to their, to add to their morbidity. Uh, of, 
You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, because yeah. many of yeah. these cases were, were 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 neglected. But I always, uh, how do you say it? I I wouldn't blow it up, you know. And then um, I would just say that um, we have a team, a multidisciplinary team, who are good in. Um, in 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 each other specialties, yeah. So we have a team, and we will work together, hands in hands, yeah, to do our best. But we cannot promise you um, any any perfect uh, surgical outcome because of the <clears throat> negligence of the cases, okay. of the delayed delayed procedures that were supposed to be done earlier. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Magda. Uh, I have a question to Dr. Hilmi. Dr. Hilmi, in a uh, perfect trauma, you said that this need an inter or multidisciplinary approach. So uh, this means that many surgeons will be involved. So uh, what or who will work earlier? the orthopedic surgeon, the vascular surgeon, or the urologist surgeon before the orthopedic surgeon work, or to guarantee the stability of the pelvic, the orthopedic surgeon should be the first. Uh, can you explain about uh, this situation? Hey, uh... Thank you, uh, Dr. Peter, for your question. The important thing is uh, if we deal with the patient with the emergency condition, especially with the patient life saving, we must thinking about who at all, what is condition will be worse. Yeah. Example the, uh, for the example, if the patient uh, has a pure pelvic uh, around the pelvis with the complication complication like uh, my my example with just uh, just rupture perineum rupture uh, rupture of the Vagina, maybe stable uh, f stabilization of the pelvic is uh, mandatory because the before we we doing uh, another surgery. For example, for the patient like uh, injury in the perineum and vag vag uh, vagina, the position with with the what is called uh, like a like a bird ah uh, lithotomy if the patient uh, the uh, put in the pitot uh, lito, lito uh, position pelvis becoming unstable what so so why the stability of the pelvis is a important step before you're doing another surgery. Also, okay. if the patient with unstable pelvis and unstable hemodynamic, hemodynamic maybe uh, cause of uh, intra bleeding before we doing laparotomy, the fixation of the bone or bone fixation for the pelvic is the important too. It mean if the patient come with a uh, un uh, hemodynamic and unstable pelvis, the first thing we do uh, stabilize stabilize of the pelvic because, like uh, I mentioned before in the uh, formula, in, uh, if pelvis. Uh, Unstable can collect uh, blood until four or five mil uh, liter. Uh, you can imagine. 
Yeah. Okay. This this uh, this why the stabilization of the pelvic is uh, mandatory first. This is my answer. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hilby. Uh, now I will open the discussion to the floor. Any other question from the floor? May I ask a question to Dr. Yep. Hilby? Yes, yeah, sure, Peter? please. Yeah. Uh, one of the options of man managing a pelvic uh, trauma or a pelvic hemorrhage is to uh, perform an uh, embolization of yeah. the uh, arteries or vein in the pelvic area. Do you have any experience on this? Because uh, doing uh, pelvic packing, uh, I've done that uh, procedures, but it's not so too effective to, to uh, prevent an ongoing loss. So we still have to do something else besides uh, doing a packing. And packing requires laparotomy, which means that the patient have to go to the OR for uh, sometimes a not so effective procedures. Uh, wh what is your experience, Dr. Kilmi, on uh, embolization for uh, pelvic bleeding? Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Franz. Unfortunately, I have not experienced with the embolization because uh, I don't know why. Yeah. If, uh, you know, in the we are hospital, the angiography, not the emergency department. It is others uh, building. The first, the second, the main power, not uh, in the on site. Oh, yeah. every, every time, this, we have uh, many problem. Why? Yeah. In the emergency skin, we we never do angiography, angiography and embolization. But yeah. for the late case, we, we we do it. But for emergencies, I never never done. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, maybe uh, Doctor Peter, you you know about the uh, we are condition as to the condition. Okay. No, I think that's the answer. That's a practical, practical situation. Yeah. So I yeah. think, yeah, that we have, we have to look for the way out here yeah, to overcome this problem. Okay. Thank you, Doctor uh, Franz and Doctor Hilmi. I have a question uh, to Doctor Hilmi again. Uh, instead of the use of C clamp, oh, yeah. about uh, the simple methods about the pelvic sling you just hang the, the, the uh, patient pelvis hang to the a sling so it will uh, make uh, maybe a reduction and also immobilization and this this will help uh, to stop the bleeding of the retroperitoneal bleeding do you have any uh, comment about this uh Thank you, Doctor Doctor Peter. If you use a pelvic sling, yeah, there is just a limited role, especially for close book type. If the uh, if the pelvic uh, fra uh, unstable pelvic with a close book type, if we use uh, pelvic sling, becoming more becoming more close okay. and the yeah the, the problem maybe uh, we have another problem yeah okay. why we just use a simple simple method like a sheet sheet circumference sheet it's very maybe just four minutes we can be uh, we can be we can done just four minutes Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shelby. Any other question from the floor? Maybe one question. If there is no question, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Max Downham to address the impression notes of this session. Mr. Max Downham, the floor is yours. 
Well, Dr. Manopo, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Hutagalong and uh, Dr. Chomi, uh, Professor Sufas, uh, and all of you, the others of you who have spoken. I thank you as a privilege to be part of this. Um, I'm a lay person, for those that may not know that. I really am not qualified to judge medically or whatever uh, aspects of this wonderful program. I do note the following that it's a high quality, Dr. Manopo, high, high quality program. The slides are very, very professionally well done. They're very informative. Um, all three speakers uh, you know, speak excellent English. The communications are terrific. And I think that uh, the other thing I noted uh, if from a lay perspective is the multidisciplinary, the, the teamwork approach. Uh, I know that uh, Dr. Hutagalang uh, mentioned working with other departments and so forth and the 3D printing. And uh, uh, this is, uh, it's not only indicative of teamwork, but uh, advanced technology and taking advantage of the best technology that's available. So it's a very impressive program. Uh, I commend you again, uh, Dr. Manopo, for your coordination of this program and all of the leaders of the Indonesian section. It's, it's a privilege for me to be a part of this, really. And uh, uh, I thank you for that opportunity. So thank you, sir, and thank all of you. Thank you very much, Mr. Max Dornham, for your uh, impression notes. And now we come to the, to the end of this session. On behalf of the International College of Surgery Indonesia section, I would like to express my gratitude to all participants and particularly to the speakers, Professor George Sulfas, Dr. Huta Galung, and Dr. Hilmi for the dedication and contribution, and also for the words. Uh, uh, officers, the president, Professor Georges Sulpas, the executive uh, officer of the World uh, Office of the ICS, Mr. Max Downham, and the office bearers from the Indonesian section, uh, Professor Paul Taleli, Professor Henry Hendarto, Dr. Franz Arifin, and uh, Dr. Diaz Marwati. And also to our IT team, Mr. Bimo and Ms. Devi, for all your contribution to this session. Thank you very much. Uh, good night. Good uh, health for all of you. And we will meet uh, next month in the different uh, topic and speakers. Thank you very much and stay healthy. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Bye. Yeah.